coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. What happens now is that like every crazy personality with like a single, like even remotely political ax to grind, like enters into this essentially cage match. I mean, it's like we, it's like a jello, it's like a jello fight between all of these different people. People forget that like, you know, Gary Coleman, <laughs> but I shouldn't, I shouldn't make fun because he's now, you know, rest in, rest in peace. Gary, but like, you know, he, his campaign included an appearance on a one time only TV game show called Who Wants to Be Governor of California? <laughs> the debating game. That's this is like, you know, real uh, like schlocky Hollywood stuff that we're about to watch. And I'm kind of enjoying it. Welcome once again to The Roundtable, our weekly podcast here at the American Mind at the Claremont Institute. I'm your host, Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute, publisher of the Claremont Review of Books and the American Mind. I am joined as always by Matthew Peterson, a vice president of education here at the Claremont Institute and founding editor of the American Mind, James Pullis, executive editor of the American Mind, Spencer Clavin, associate editor of both the American Mind and the Claremont Review of Books, and Seth Barron, all the way from New York, as always, Managing Editor of The American Mind. Uh, well, welcome, gents. Uh, I thought we'd open today with California, where uh, currently only Jake and I are, and then Alyssa. Uh, well, no, James, sorry. No, James is in Florida. Is that right? I'm back. No, I'm you're, not, back. I'm you're back. You're back. In, back in SoCal. James is in Glendale, uh, a wonderful uh, storied community in uh, uh, Northeast Los Angeles. So California... First, the Newsom recall. The recall is on. Uh, the uh, Republican-led effort to get enough signatures has succeeded. Uh, Gavin Newsom will face the judgment of his uh, constituents and his haters uh, across the state uh, before too long. Uh, interesting development. Uh, I think, is it right? It's only the second successful uh, actually recall to proceed in uh in California's history, the, of course, the last one was when Gray Davis, among other things, faced the wrath of the voters for uh, doubling or so the car registration fee, among other um, iniquities. And then we had Arnold Schwarzenegger, which started out promising but uh, ended uh, worse than worse than mediocre. And uh, we have to note that uh, a couple of the candidates announced who are going to be right. It's remarkably easy to run. In a uh, California recall election, you just have to, I think it's a few thousand bucks and 2,500 signatures or something like that. So very doable for all manner of folks. The last recall, we had dozens and dozens and dozens of candidates, including a porn star running against uh, Gray Davis for the governor's mansion. This year, we have Caitlyn Jenner, among others, formerly Bruce Jenner, which is interesting. The, uh, the sort of running joke on the um, cynical right is that the GOP establishment is going to soon champion the fact that the, the, possible, the possibility of the first transgender governor beckons historically for the GOP in California, which, went, which should, uh, should um, rightfully be met with much ridicule given uh, the GOP's putative stances on cultural issues in the last decades. Uh, and then it wasn't in the show notes, but I chastised Jake, but uh, late comer making motions about running could save us from having to vote for, uh, for Caitlin. Uh, and that is Randy Quaid, beloved actor uh, from uh, among other glories of comedy as Christmas vacation and uh, with his own colorful past in the state of California and in news in recent years. So uh, boys, it's shaping up to be a, a blockbuster fall here in California. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, first of all, I'm safely out of the chaos. So I get to watch Matt and I get to sort of like watch gleefully from afar, which means that our emotional stake in this whole <laughs> saga is going to be very different from the rest of you poor saps. And there is a certain like, I, I will confess, there's a, once you get out, there's a certain like, just want to watch the world burn vibe but i also and this is like again maybe me on the therapist couch a little bit but like <laughs> there is a certain residual primal 
animal hatred for Gavin Newsom and his stupid, smug, like slicked over face and, and just all of the arbitrary, despotic, seemingly in some cases such as that of Grace Church and Jack MacArthur, Pastor Jack MacArthur's purely vindictive ways in which the California state behaved toward its citizens, especially its business owning citizens, especially its middle and lower class citizens. I mean, this man is like, you know, I, 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 I have to stop my pull myself back from hyperbole from calling this man a criminal from calling him a, a, a like a sort of bargain bin despot, all of these things <laughs> are, you know, this is like raw emotional stuff. And I don't think just for for me, people who lived through this era in California politics, and let's not forget through the ravaging of Los Angeles as one of the you know uh, American cities that was torn to shreds right before they locked us right back down. I mean, you have people who have been in different parts of the country have to remember that California went into and then out of and then back into lockdown in ways that were obviously having much more to do with political expediency than anything else. So there is, I will freely confess, like to you, my brothers and sisters listening, like there is a certain pure vindictive delight in seeing this person have his ass handed to him by a blue state, right? I mean, this is not like, you know, as he tried to portray it as kind of like a Republican psyop or Republican operation. Like, no, this is just like people who were fed up. All of that having been said, right, in the in the lead up to this, I don't think like people who don't live in California or even people who do, but just like forgot about 2003. Like, I don't know that we like have really reckoned with what comes next. Like what happens now is that like every crazy personality with like a single, like even remotely political ax to grind, like enters into this essentially cage match. I mean, it's like, we, it's like a jello, it's like a jello fight between all of these different people. People forget that like, you know, Gary Coleman, <laughs> but I shouldn't, I shouldn't make fun because he's now, you know, rest in, rest in peace, Gary, but like, you know, he, his campaign included an appearance on a one time only TV game show called Who Wants to Be Governor of California? <laughs> the debating game. That's this is like, you know, real uh, like schlocky Hollywood stuff that we're about to watch. And I'm kind of enjoying it. I don't think that like California is about to be uh, wrested back from the, the grips of progressivism anytime soon. But I have a certain a certain enjoyment and a certain kind of hope, I guess, out of the fact that people like there is a certain point past which you just can't push people before they start to uh, really take matters into their own hands and vote you out. Yeah, we should take this occasion too to um, just repeat a point from weeks and weeks ago, at least, which is, you know, early, you know, you heard some grumblings on the right on the kind of, what would you call, for lack of a better term, the kind of um, constitutionally moderate, right? The, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, types <laughs> who said, well, you know, I mean, Newsom recall, I mean, be careful what you wish for. You might get something worse. And uh, to which I responded at the time, and I think I said it on this podcast, this just is a fundamental misunderstanding of politics. I mean, w winning has its own virtue in a way, not by any means at all, but, um, but just the mere fact that you have the opportunity to stop Gavin Newsom's national political career, or at least put a major speed bump in it, given how corrupt and slimy the guy is and, and uh, how entrenched he is in the kind of California oligarchy and the, the many just offensive ways in which he was a complete hypocrite and flaunted the rules he imposed on the rest of California, as Spencer had mentioned uh, a bit. I mean, that the fact alone of punishing that man for that is an un unalloyed political good. Uh, yeah. So, you know, let's do that first. And uh, yeah, we might get something worse, but remember, it's California. So uh, first of all, I mean, half the state's governed by not the governor. I mean, all these boards scattered everywhere. I mean, it's a, it's a damn mess. Uh, so I don't think all that much would change even with a, with uh, some sort of lunatic in the governor's mansion. And it, it won't be some sort of lunatic. It'll be, you know, a kind of a moderate lunatic. So Beat Gavin first, punish the man for a variety of reasons, uh, make an example of him across the country for uh, what can happen to you if you are, you know, sort of capricious, arbitrary, and insulated, and uh, you flaunt, uh, flaunt the decency and good opinion of your voters long enough, something will happen to you. That's a, that's a triumph for democracy, democracy if you ask me. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I'm totally heartened. I mean, I, I'm over in New York, and I don't know much about California politics, but uh, I mean, I, Gavin Newsom is loathsome. Uh, he's just so um, 
unctuous and uh, and 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 slimy and connected. Uh, so the fact that that people are anxious to eager to turn him out is great. And you know, I'm no huge fan of Caitlyn Jenner, but the idea that uh, she is running and saying, you know, look, just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I'm a liberal. And, you know, making all these statements about out of control prosecutors. Uh, I mean, this is someone who was photographed wearing a MAGA hat, who's now talked seriously about becoming the governor of California. Um, I mean, this is this is marvelous. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking maybe this could like really be a sign of um, the tide turning. You know, maybe I'm just being like irrationally exuberant. But um, look, I'm going to I'm going to take my 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 good omens where, 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 where I see them. OK, well, you know, I guess I'm going to have to give a little bit of a minority report here. I mean, I was I was around in and around Malibu for long enough to have seen the Caitlyn Jenner phenomenon uh, developed from its very first uh, stirrings, so to speak. Um, back in the day, uh, Bruce Jenner, then Bruce Jenner, uh, would like to hang out uh, at the Chipotle in the Malibu Country Mart, uh, growing his hair out very long. Uh, people were wondering what was up with what was up with Bruce. Uh, rumors began to spread, uh, and then a little bit later, um, something that has kind of dropped down the memory hole a little bit, and hopefully. Um, for for uh, for Jenner's sake, uh, will not resurface uh, to cause undue trauma. But uh, there was a car accident. Jenner was behind the wheel. There's a, a death trap on the PCH right in front of Dukes there in Malibu. And uh, locals know this is a good place to die. Uh, whenever you see a, an ambulance rushing down PCH, it's usually for something going around in that area. Jenner did did hit someone. Uh, I don't really remember the details. Um, the media made sure of that. Um, but you know, I was raised uh, at a time uh, of of traditional values. You know, times have changed, <laughs> and uh, I know people have have different views now and, and see you know like reality TV celebrities as uh, as as dignified members of society uh, who are just <laughs> as entitled to uh, participate in politics as the rest of us. Judge, you know, your mileage may vary. I, I haven't seen all that many episodes of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, but I did see some some troubling stuff uh, suggesting, um, you know, limited commitment to uh, serious political engagement. Maybe maybe that'll grow over time. But, uh, you know, California's worst stereotypes oftentimes bubble up to the surface in uh, in moments of crisis. Uh, this may be no different. This is why we have you on this podcast. James, among many other reasons, your wisdom, but also the California lore from the last decade. It's just mm -hmm. priceless. Mm -hmm. It adds color, you know. Well, her page is up now. His page is up. I don't know. Like, the, I feel like this is the major problem for conservatives, really. Like, the, the, the Caitlyn Jenner for governor page is now up. There's nothing on it. Like, you can't see any platforms. It's just a donate page and whatever. Um, and it does strike me as kind of an interesting problem. I, if I had to put money on it, I would guess that this, like, much like Arnold Schwarzenegger before Caitlyn Jenner, will get somebody who has some sort of conservative bona fides, is a breath of fresh air uh, in the context of California politics, and then basically like withers into a sort of run of the mill, ineffectual rhino, or, you know. But again, all of this is talking out of my hat because I don't know yet what the, the platform's going to be. I do think like in another universe where we weren't wrapped up in this insane woke ascendancy, there would be a way to relate to this candidate on a cultural level that would be semi-coherent for conservatives. And that would be, you know what, like this is a kind of a, a weird thing that like a vanishingly small percentage of the population goes through. You deal with that however you deal with it. I like bear no ill will toward this person. This person builds, bears no ill will toward me. Like maybe I call him Bruce. Maybe I call her Caitlin. Like we, we sort of figure out in a potential way how we're going to relate to one another. And then we evaluate on the basis of the of policies, like whether this is a viable Republican candidate. Um, that is not the world that we live in. And so conservatives have to figure out how to deal with like maybe getting on board with this platform, maybe not in the context of also insisting that we are not going to like get wrapped up into this absolutely wackadoodle language game that is purely about pretending that 
like black is white and white is black, right? Like the the, trans, the, 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 the the whole trans women or women thing has actually made it impossible to relate to trans people if you don't believe that they just magic themselves into another gender. Like what's so like bitterly ironic about it all is that like the the left has actually removed from conservatives the option that we used to have of like, well, I don't approve of this or I do approve. I, th I think it's on my business, uh, even if I think it's kind of weird. Like there's really none of that available to conservatives. And so they've been backed into this corner where like, how do we even support somebody regardless of this person's individual beliefs about these issues? Like, how do you support somebody who has like by virtue of just like her chosen identity, like aligned herself with a really pernicious and totally uh, like overwhelming rhetorical assault on like America and reality itself. I don't know. I find it an interesting problem. Well, and this is, you know, ultimately yeah. just to, to put on the, the media theory hat for a brief shining moment, probably the ground on which people will gather to adjudicate this kind of confusing mess is the ground of internet humor in all of its like glorious vulgarity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there is probably going to be this sensibility that will, that will get some real traction that there's poetic justice in the fact that, you know, in order for Gavin Newsom's ass to be handed to him, Bruce Jenner's penis had to be handed to him. <laughs> That's the kind of thing that people appreciate in internet circles and it's leeching into real life. Um, and it's, you know, in one sense, it's a coarsening of the culture. And in another sense, it is, I think, reflective of a, a you know, a, a, a heavy lift, a real effort to like find a basis for a common culture, even if it is kind of like ridiculous and degraded. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I've been quiet long enough <laughs> talking about many things near and dear to my heart. <laughs> Um, I think first off in the immortal words of Peachy Keenan, finally a female governor with balls. <laughs> I think she's right. I will say this, this like tale that, that, um, that James is telling is just perfect and it's appropriate. And uh, the accelerationist in me now that I've left is very happy with all of this. Look, there is no better representation for the world's sixth largest economy in the state of California. There's no better representation for America right now these are the times that try men's souls. I mean, and, and in these times, we need people of ambiguous genital, genital mutilation to take over. And this qualifies them to run things. And, and really, I mean, there is no better, there is no better representation for America and, uh, you know, where this side of America is going than just to make, you know, Caitlin now. Put Caitlin in charge as as uh, as uh, James and I were saying, like monarch, right? And this is a this is Caitlyn Jenner's mutilated body is the state of California. The king's body principle applies here. That is America now. Let it be. Now, uh, having said that, and loving the acceleration and wanting it to happen, and I can see it happening because uh, Mr. Jenner or Miss Jenner or whatever he wants to call himself is going to say all kinds of conservative things and get away with them because be, because he's in a dress and in makeup and has transformed himself physically. So he'll, that's like his sacrifice to the gods so that he can say other things that are just normal commonsensical things about like homelessness and how California is falling apart. And so because, you know, he's performed these rituals upon himself, to the demons that, that you know, the, the, the demonic religion of our time, he'll be able to say some true things. And that may be enough to get him pretty far. And that's fantastic. But having said all that and, and rooting for um, really the, the candidacy, and as Ryan said, this is only the second time that you've actually had a gubernatorial recall in California go through. I think I said, I just looked it up 10 times, there's been an actual recall that, you know, that came to pass. But that's not for the governorship. Uh, for, the, for the governor position, it's only once before with Gray Davis. So this is all going to go through. It's going to be a circus. It's going to be grand and glorious. We're far beyond the point where you can expect any kind of, you know, rational or good result in California. California and New York haven't even reached the top of the crescendo, by the way, right? They haven't even got to the point where the great collapse starts. They're still crescendoing. They're still going to the big explosion when 
it just becomes completely reduced to the absurd. And then you have the Venezuelan collapse. We're not even to the pinnacle yet. And this is, this is great. So let's get there. But just all this leading to very personally, very selfishly, just want to say there is one thing that I'm going to miss about California and be pissed about leaving so soon. Uh, only one thing I'm very, I'm not looking back at all. And that is that if Randy Quaid is in the recall and runs for governor, I will regret not being able to vote for that bearded Q adjacent man. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to be able to do that because I'm gone from the state. And, you know, Randy Quaid, I have a lot of love for is one of these, uh, you know, lovable, uh, uh, just American rascals who just doesn't even doesn't even care. And I won't be able to vote for him in seriousness for governor of the six, the sixth largest economy in the world. And instead, um, we'll just have to watch Caitlin win from afar. But, you know, I mean, these are the sacrifices we make. We should uh, we should maybe end our discussion of uh, of Jenner and the recall with just a we've brought up this theme or talked this way about politics on this before, but we should just remind our conservative friends who are kind of prone to, you know, mouthing stuff like, you can't do that. That's not conservative uh, in complete abstraction from the times in which we live to say that, look, I mean, prudence is hard. Never say never, as Aristotle might put it. You never know how things will be. So it, as, uh, as has been eloquently illustrated by some of my colleagues here, it may be that it will come down to you to cast the vote as the least bad option. But I will, I will add the proviso that uh, we do not endorse candidates here at the Claremont Institute. We merely like to have fun on this podcast talking about the uh, absurd state of our current California state politics. We hope that this uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek discussion has uh, broadened your horizons a bit and uh, you make your own decision in good conscience. Uh, I will just bring up one more thing about California, and that is the 2020 census has finally been tabulated and finalized, and California, for the first time in its history, has lost population and will lose a house seat, which means it lose, loses one electoral vote. Uh, for those of you who haven't recently brushed up on your civics, every state gets all of their members of their house, of the house, how many they have, plus their two senators, and that's their electoral college vote count. So California will lose one. Uh, Pennsylvania is losing one. Uh, Michigan is losing one or two. I think New York's losing one. Is that right, Seth? I think that's right. Yes, yes. New York is losing one by 89 people. Right, by they only, amazing. They only counted mm -hmm. another 89 people. They yeah. wouldn't have won. So the, the general migration has been uh, Texas is gaining two seats. I think Florida is gaining two seats. So the uh, the trend, the mig in migration trend in the United States that has been going on for decades, that is to say, out of the Midwest and the Northeast and into the Sun Belt. Uh, continues the trend of people going to California, which is uh, was recent until not too long ago, uh, has stopped and reversed. And um, just cue the calls for. Um, I mean, the, the, a certain branch of of left wing Democrat these days says the electoral college is racist and based on white supremacy. In our current political environment, with uh, sort of Trump and the Republicans, uh, the state of them right now look forward to many, many more arguments about this census being racist. It's already been kind of made in various ways, but it's just going to accelerate now that effectual truth of the last census is that net Republican states, red states, that is, are gaining electoral college votes and blue ones are losing them. And I suspect if we had held this census two years from now, it would have been even more pronounced given the last year's worth of, of moving around the country. So a pretty interesting development. Can, can I add to that real quick, yep. Ryan? Just a few sentences. Um, I haven't verified this yet, but I've heard from a few people that Idaho would have gained as well with, you know, a very small, a small fraction of people, just like, uh, just like New York, you know, lost two by a small fraction. So if we had counted right. today, you mean, or so? Yeah. 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 And so, so they, they were very close from, from gaining even more. I would, I, I just also, we should just emphasize everything you just said is true. And it's doubly and trebly true because they've been gaming the system on the census this entire time, and they're going to fight it in the courts like crazy over the next few years. Mm -hmm. And it is disgusting what has happened with the census because these are numbers they are basically forced to put out, which are not good for the left. But that's after they've already fought, right, even being able to count who's an illegal immigrant mm -hmm. or not. And they delayed I mean, this so last like, count too, yeah. Yeah, so they're counting 
they're counting illegals, they're counting as, as everything they can. They fought tooth and nail um, and, and really cheated in multiple ways across these states, I'll just assert, if you look into it. And still, uh, they can't hide the fact that they are losing big time. I'm sure they're really kicking themselves over New York because I've just said under 100 people. They were so close to holding well, on to the, to I'm, holding on Matt, to the I'm, ultra, I'm ultra. really uh, grateful and proud to be with you as part of this uh, movement. Like these, ultimately, you can't cheat your way out of like misgoverning, so drastically misgoverning every state, municipality, locality, and city over which you have a, an ounce of power. Like that's what this amounts to. They just so completely like cocked up everything that they did that like the uh, people fled in droves. And I wonder, you know, th th these, city these cities, as we have said now multiple times in this podcast, are draining 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 citizens these states are draining people we're all congregating in places like nashville and texas and florida which are red states this is as again we have also said before a sociological movement that is could potentially be epoch making and because it's bad press for democrats there are none of the studies going on about it that we might like to be going on or at least none being publicized in the press like we just don't know yet how this is all going to shake out sorry go ahead no finish Oh, OK. Yeah, I, 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 we just don't know how this is going to shake out. And this is not the only thing that will happen. Like the realignment of, of electoral votes is not the only thing that will change. But one like hopeful thing that might occur is that it might actually be a dilution of blue votes, because some of these people who are fleeing are not dyed in the wool Republicans. They're not even necessarily going to vote red where they go next. It's just that even like the, the, the reality of their life and the evidence of their feet belies their stupid principles, which they will probably continue to vote according to, except that they'll be voting in places where that won't matter as much. And so it's very, very possible that this will be like electorally really good for Republicans, no matter which way you slice it. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's, there's downsides to all this, but just one thing real quick that I think we should add as a cherry on top. You know how many people I've talked to in uh, who have moved, whether it's to... Uh, you know, Idaho, <laughs> fastest growing real estate market folks in the country in Coeur d'Alene in northern Idaho. Someone sent the article, one of you earlier today. Um, Idaho is, is perfect. I mean, it really is the perfection of, of so many of the states people are moving to, in my opinion. But the thing is, we've been fed a lot of lies, too. Like the PSYOP about all the blue city places is, is real. And you get these people who come to Dallas or come to Miami or, you know, or move to Nashville and they really have, I mean, just stupid stereotypes that you, you know, you, I mean, you see it in New York publications about LA all the time, right? Where like someone takes a trip mm. to California and they're like, LA is different. And wow, mm -hmm. oh, it's not what people said. And uh, I got on a plane and visited America. And, and you get this from, from all the bubbles across the country on the, on the right and left coast. And so, so the, the lies, I mean, the, the reality is that all these places people are moving are, are better than they expected in many ways, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of what even the Wall Street Journal has been reporting. And so I don't think there's any way to stop the momentum behind these trends. Um, you know, there's no way to stop this momentum. This is now a full on flight out of these states. Mm -hmm. Every statistic shows it. It's not going to stop anytime soon. And it's going to fundamentally reshape American politics and how politicians respond to it is is what's uh, essential. Good. Well, that's enough about California. I will flag one last thing. It's not about California, but everyone, it's a, an indication of our current divide and the um, gap between um, the sort of cognoscenti on both sides and the the elite on both sides. Normally, I would not inflict on any of you reading Ryan Cooper. Uh, but if you go to the week and read his latest, you will see the mirror image of the worry of a lot of conservatives and Republicans about the Democrats' proposal to do the Equity Act, especially to do H.R. 1, uh, which would um, you know loosen voting laws across the country and enable more fraud, in our opinion. Um, and then also to add D.C. and Puerto Rico as states, to add senators. So there's that concern on the right. And to a lot on the right, it looks like the Democrats trying to win semi-permanently, finally, by having a kind of hammer lock on, uh, on electoral college majorities going forward, and at least on control of the Senate, if not eventually the House, in perpetuity. 
But the other side, or a portion of it, thinks the exact opposite. So just go read Ryan Cooper. It's called The Republican Plot to Steal the 2024 Election. It's a mirror image of that worry on the right. And it's just those two contesting uh, viewpoints and how they view facts differently and how they view intentions differently and how in many ways neither, um, I think the left more so than the right really doesn't understand the right as it understands itself and it's reflected in that piece and uh, it's a an indicator of why our divide is so deep and uh, intractable and vitriolic at times. I just wanted to flag, let's do this section quickly, gents, if we can. Uh, that doesn't mean just me talking, but uh, we want to save ample time to get to Jonah Goldberg at the end. We just want to run through these developments in big tech, which is in the happens in the larger context of various states, especially Republican states, some of them big, uh, trying to do something about uh, big tech's uh, seemingly efforts to constrain the public spheres and the velocity and quality of information flying around it uh, sort of in a decentralized or uncontrolled fashion. So this from Tallahassee, um, this is from the uh, Sun Sentinel. In one of Governor Ron DeSantis' top priorities of the legislative session, the Florida Senate on Monday passed a measure to crack down on social media companies that remove users from their platforms. The Republican-controlled Senate voted 22 to 17 along most uh, almost straight party lines to approve the proposal which will now go to the House. Uh, DeSantis has made it a priority uh, after especially Twitter and Facebook blocked uh, former President Donald Trump from their platforms in January. The bill in part would bar social media companies from removing political candidates from the company's platforms. Companies that violate the prohibition could face fines of $100,000 a day for statewide candidates and $10,000 a day for other candidates. The proposal also would require social media companies to publish standards about issues such as blocking users and apply the standards consistently. No doubt lawsuits are soon to come. Uh, another big state, Texas Senate. This is uh, uh, KCBD.com. Texas Senate approves a bill to stop social media companies from banning Texans for political views. First published by the Texas Tribune, a nonprofit, nonpartisan media organization, the Texas Senate early Thursday approved a bill that would prohibit social media companies with at least 100 million monthly users from blocking, banning, demonetizing, or discriminating against a user based on their viewpoint or their location within Texas. So interesting development there. Uh, of course, we should expect lawsuits on all of these. Then Judicial Watch has this interesting piece, which partly actually has to do with them. Um, they did, a, a Tom Fitton, who runs Judicial Watch, did a video about... Um, uh, them challenging California to clean up voter rolls, and it led to uh, to the social media companies removing this content. It was, YouTube was in question at the time. So just a few tweets just summarizing this uh, for our edification. Judicial Watch received 540 pages and a supplemental four pages of documents from the Office of the Secretary of State of California, revealing how state officials pressured social media companies, that is Twitter, Facebook, Google, YouTube, to censor posts about the 2020 election. Included in these documents were misinformation briefings, emails that were compiled by communications firm SKDK that lists Biden for president as their top client of 2020. Quote from Judicial Watch, these documents blow up the big lie that big tech censorship is private as the documents show collusion between a whole group of government officials in multiple states to suppress speech about election controversies. Then there is this thing. So Patrice Colors of Black Lives Matter, as uh, our, our very well-read, most of our well-read listeners know, it was in the news lately that Ms. Colors had been on a bit of a real estate buying spree in recent years or last year or so, racking up to the tune of about $3 million. One of her properties was in Topanga Canyon, which is a nice semi-rural part of, uh, you know, uh, northern Los Angeles County, or may even be just north of the county. I think it's north north part of the county. With, uh, with the ironic demographic fact of being only about 2% black as a, as a community. And uh, she spent $1.4 million on the house. You know, everyone was using it as the opportunity, as we have on this podcast, to point out the, the extent to which a lot of these uh, nonprofit grass tops organization for putative social justice causes uh, can become grifts for their founders and funnels money to them. I think that's the case here. But Facebook decided under a f putatively neutral policy of not giving out uh, house information or residence information of people that that story, the fact of Patrice Glores buying an expensive house in a very white neighborhood, despite uh, what you would think from her Black Lives Matter rhetoric and uh, advocacy, 
uh, was kind of hypocritical. But you couldn't post that on Facebook under the the excuse that it was, uh, you know, sl uh, a step down the path of doxing her and uh, issuing threatening things. I'll let everyone draw their own conclusions from that. And then finally, last piece, former Claremont Lincoln fellow, James O'Keefe, who runs the excellent and interesting Project Veritas, is suing Twitter in the Supreme Court of New York today, uh, this was April 19th, over false and defamatory statements made by the big tech giant. Uh, the lawsuit was set in motion after O'Keefe's personal account with about a million followers received a permanent ban from Twitter for operating, quote, fake accounts. The ban was issued almost immediately following Veritas's release of a bombshell undercover CNN video where the technical director, Charlie Chester, calls the network propaganda and admits to using fear as a way to drive viewership. Then they have, you know, they have a bit of the court ruling there. I'll just uh, summarize these points that they make in their uh, in their their brief. Mr. O'Keefe is a journalist whose reputation depends on his ethical and transparent conduct and his production of reliable and accurate news reporting. Twitter's published claim that Mr. O'Keefe operated fake accounts is patently and demonstrably, fa demonstrably false. Moreover, as detailed below, as the owner and operator of its own platform, Twitter was in a unique position to know that this claim was false. Alternatively, given the extent of its knowledge and information, Twitter acted with reckless disregard for the falsity of this claim when it published it. These are all watchwords in, uh, in libel and defamation jurisprudence, even for uh, journalistic organizations like Twitter, well, platforms, I guess, like Twitter. Twitter's false claim that Mr. O'Keefe used fake accounts on Twitter has caused him damage, and unless retracted, will continue to cause him damage as is set forth in detail below. O'Keefe intends to show how Twitter acted with reckless disregard for the falsity of this claim. So very interesting developments on the big tech front. You know, this is dividing conservatives, uh, let alone libertarians. It's dividing the right. What, what exactly to do about this? You know, how do you respect the property rights of a private company while also acknowledging the huge and often monopolistic or oligopolistic control it exer exercises over an increasingly large part of the public square and the, the um, you know, trading of information and the judgments regular citizens might draw from looking at that information about what they ought to think about politics and their politicians. So lots of movement afoot. Uh, it's, it's something to be watched. I, I'm, I, for one, kind of favor experimentation in this regard. We can learn from our mistakes. Uh, I would uh, offer that the right needs to be a little more adroit in how they offer solutions to this problem. You can't just say they're private companies, therefore they can do whatever they want, in, in my humble opinion. Well, it's, you know, you've missed a hundred percent of the shots you don't take, right? So <laughs> this is one of those things where, well, sure, it'll get challenged in the courts and then they'll like the, why not fight them? You know, you certainly won't learn anything by, by, you know, not attempting to deal with this. I'll, I will be pretty brief uh, since we only have a moment to talk about this, but look like this stuff is obviously a, an unprecedented and, and newly, uh, you know, unprecedented both in form and in strength, a threat to our First Amendment rights. And I'll preview that in the Claremont Review of Books, which is coming out very shortly, the cover is about big tech and technology in general. It features one James Poulos, sort of a, um, you know, I, I've never heard of him personally, but I guess a lot of he has a lot of followers and he's uh, the cover essay. But we also then have a, an essay on this issue by Dan Oliver, formerly of, of, of Reaganite fame. And he floats this idea of viewpoint discrimination as very much one of the serious options on the table for legislation going forward. So this seems promising, yeah. the idea that you can't, uh, over a certain amount of strength, you can't discriminate on the basis purely of like what somebody believes. And it's so obvious that's what's going on. So all, and, I'm all for it. And Dan was an FCC commissioner, wasn't he, Spencer? Mm, yes. Or yeah, at yeah. least an FCC lawyer. I think a commissioner, yeah. Anyway, yeah, go check out that. Our, uh, chairman, our, chairman of the FCC, yeah. Thank uh, you. 1986, 1990. Yeah. Dan's, uh, Dan is also a wonderful human being, uh, as yes. is his wife. There. And, it's a good, and it's a good piece. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, go check it out. Uh, rather than spoiling the, uh, <laughs> the essay that I have been honored with uh, cover appearance, I will say that for me, yeah, big picture is going to be a lot of experimentation and we've just begun to see the beginning of it. I mean, playing out against the backdrop of the great resort of Americans moving to places where they feel like they can live and the extension of technological power over the country that follows you wherever you go are crashing birth rates. Uh, birth rates are going down around the world. America is no exception. Uh, the, the Jenners may be particularly good at peopling the earth with their tribe. 
uh, but that is not the case for for many subgroups in America. And uh, you know, regardless of which subgroup you belong to, uh, you may not have um, a great desire to uh, to fill America with, uh, as Matt Iglesias likes to say, one billion newcomers. And so you're going to have you're going to have a bigger America uh, with fewer uh, people in it potentially going forward. And if you know if things really take a dire turn, and those news stories that we hear about crashing sperm counts are true, even among dogs apparently, uh, then uh, people are going to need to band together, and they're going to uh, feel more distant from uh, other groups of other people. And so I expect that, that would mean greater variation in policy across states and even within states. Uh, it's some of the stuff that you can do to organize people um, uh, along uh, affinity and identity. Uh, can be done very effectively online, but there's no substitute for doing it in real life. Um, and I think that, you know, as the, the coming decades unfold and the appetite for experimentation amidst, uh, you know, our failing institutions increases, uh, you know, could, real life communities of, of close knit uh, people who are well aligned are going to continue to find new ways of availing themselves of tech and of law um, that helps keep them feel like they can keep their way of life uh, viable and, and, uh, and fruitful and vibrant amidst really wrenching changes. Yeah, well put, James. This this uh, topic of um, you know experimentation and policy and and especially on in areas where the right may have formerly objected or conservatives may have formerly objected on the grounds that private companies uh, you know with their terms of service and you signing up and a lot of these quote unquote getting it for free. Uh, you know they can do what they want. Uh, it's a nice lead into to, um, to Jonah Goldberg. Now we, uh, as I've put it before on this podcast, we often listen to podcasts uh, from venues that you wouldn't normally, so that you don't have to. I always listen when we come up or I come up, uh, or not always, but when I when I think it's important. So uh, Jonah Goldberg, and th this is a nice prelude actually to what we're finally going to start. A thank you to our uh, again to our. Uh, uh, commenter who suggested we give a kind of survey of the waterfront of conservatism, uh, think tanks, publications, factions, etc. We will start that really in earnest with the final segment next week. But the Goldberg thing is a nice prelude. And we'll just say quickly, uh, you know, for the ecosystem that is um, conservative media landscape, especially uh, sort of print news commentary or digital news commentary. Jonah Goldberg works at the Dispatch, which was is one of the two outgrowths of the dissolution of the Weekly Standard. Uh, the Weekly Standard split into two things. One, the first one was the Bulwark, where Jonathan Last, who's the longtime, I think James can correct me, was does Last the longtime managing editor at the Weekly Standard? Is that right, James? Um, uh, yeah, in yeah. Memory serves, that's yeah. Right. Jonathan Last sort of heads up the bulwark. Um, it's a Bill Crystal um, funded operation in part in that it, I think um, it gets some of its funding from uh, one of Crystal's umbrella organizations, which is uh, funded not solely, um, maybe not even a majority, but has some had some nice infusion from uh, left-wing billionaire Pierre Omidyar, who has been, who was mucking about among other places uh, in the last election. Uh, not illegally, but just uh, has been, was mucking about. Anyway, there was there's the bulwark, and the bulwark these days is uh, I'm, despite occasionally publishing some friends of ours who who remain pretty ecumenical about these factions. I think of Adam White or Steve Hayward. Their sort of editorial line, I'd say, has been decided become decidedly left wing in various ways. I mean, they have Molly Jongfast reporting for them, for for uh, for Pete's sake, and then the other part was the Dispatch, which. Um, I think is actually much higher quality than the Bulwark. Uh, it was founded by Steve Hayes and Jonah. It has writing for it, among others, um, David French, who we're not a huge fan of. Um, and uh, But it's a little more newsy and uh, has some interesting reporting from time to time, but uh, houses a bunch of stuff that um, we think uh, conservatism, the opinions of, of, of which we think conservatism has passed by and, and ought to ignore. Um, but, uh, you know, Jonah's not a bad guy. I know many of our audience will say I'm wrong about that, but I don't think he's a bad guy. But he took, took, uh, he took, uh, uh, did not like uh, one of my tweets. I will just jump in midstream here. And uh, I don't think I need to provide much context for this. I think Jonah speaks for it. But he offered, the reason I bring him up is because some of this will offer us a nice fodder for commentary about 
right versus left, what's conservative, what's not, the fights we're having about social media, and it's all growing out of um, a couple of tweets by J.D. Vance, criticism by David French, and then criticism of French by me. So let me just, I'll jump in. We've got like three medium-sized segments here. I'll stop at each. We can comment. And uh, I've got th things to say about each. And I think th they're just illustrative. Um, and so uh, we'll thank Jonah at least for doing that service, giving us a topic for conversation. Uh, here we are at about minute 2.15 from the Remnant podcast, uh, Jonah's thing that he does under the auspices of the dispatch. But because he's the president of the Claremont of Claremont and the publisher of the CRB, I get annoyed by his tweets. <laughs> Uh, that, that amused me because they often <laughs> run, run afoul of what I've always admired about the Claremont Institute and Claremont Review books, which was this sort of adherence to the Constitution, to probity, to seriousness. Instead, it seems more and more that a lot of these guys just are champions of popular front right wingery. Anyway, so a friend of mine sent me this tweet where he was criticizing David French for the backstory. For those of you who didn't read the Wednesday G-File, J.D. Vance who is, again, one of these guys I've met. Nice guy, liked his book. I think his heart's in the right place. Uh, Jonah had said that about me earlier. He's not sure if he's met me. He hears I'm a nice guy, etc. But he's been saying some really ridiculous things as he is preparing, as I understand it, to run for senator in Ohio. One of the things, and we'll talk more about this in a second, but one of the things that J.D. Vance tweeted about was how we should raise taxes on the globalist, globalist oligarchy. That was part of that Zoom call about Georgia's laws. Then maybe realizing that he was getting into a weird place, he then backed up and said, but there's plenty of good companies in this country, so let's cut their taxes and only raise the taxes on the ones that don't pay good wages and are part of the globalist oligarchy. Anyway, it was a dumb couple of tweets, particularly from a guy like JD who knows what he's talking about and knows what, what he was proposing was in large part unconstitutional. Anyway, to punish corporations for their political speech is unconstitutional. This used to be something that we used to celebrate on the right and ad advocate for. That, remember, Citizens United was this whole thing about how you can't stifle corporate speech just because you have a different politics and whatnot. Anyway, we'll get to all that in a second. David French points out on Twitter that a lot of that stuff that JD was talking about was just nakedly unconstitutional. JD's, JD Vance's response was to say, I'm paraphrasing, at least I'm trying something, at least I'm taking action. I'm like, David French doesn't believe in taking action, blah, blah, blah. I thought he was a really dumb and immature response, and also JD's smarter than that. I also like his very left-wing way kind of responding, which again, we'll get to in a second. But anyway, I know this is a lot of preamble. I didn't realize that the president of the Claremont Institute had chimed in around then as well and attacked David saying, French can add preemptive surrender in the culture wars as a new principle. The old principle, his go-to, always punch right. He's building quite the Vichy talent stack. That was my tweet. Okay, so this is Jonah again, and I'll stop here and we can talk about it. Uh, so first of all, the idea here being that David is akin to a Nazi collaborator for pointing out something is unconstitutional is sand poundingly stupid. But the larger point that bothers me about this was that this is the kind of stuff I expect from him these days and from a lot of people in that orbit. That makes me very sad because I used to love the Claremont Review books. Anyway, so I responded pre-coffee to Williams's tweet, quote, I remember when Claremont was defined by constitutional fidelity above all else and saw itself as a counterweight to the pandering and boob-baiting fever swamp jackassery of grifters, hysterics, and fools. Now this guy is running the place. So sad. So, first is just about this Vichy business. I mean, this is reminiscent of some of the criticisms of, you know, Mike Anton wrote a piece called Vichy Cons for us, talking about David French and others. You know, I mean, we're, we're not directly saying that David's a Nazi collaborator or akin to a Nazi collaborator. Times change. I mean, it's a polemical analogy, Jonah. Uh, and, uh, you know, quoting a, a sort of popular meme uh, about Wendy's rather than Twitter. Also, sir, this is Twitter. Polemics on Twitter are kind of the name of the game. And Jonah certainly engages in them uh, without, without abandon or with abandon. And then he says, you know, I remember when Claremont was about constitutional fidelity. Uh, one more point about the Vichy thing. What I mean by changed circumstances is, look, a lot of us think the current left regime, if it has its way, the leading edge of it at least, is something akin to, uh, you know, a new kind of, uh, I mean, it's not going to be a Nazi regime, but it's certainly totalitarian in its bent. So anyone who f misses that aspect of it and um, it's whose first reflex in a way is to criticize anyone on the right who tries to do something about it is, uh, you know, the Vichy thing is uh, is not unfair, we don't think. But, you know, we don't need to take it too literally. 
Uh, this is internet polemics. And then, yeah, I remember when Claremont was about constitutional fidelity. I mean, this is another example of, of a lot of these guys. We've, we've talked about this before, you know, priding rhetoric or style over substance, aesthetics instead of prudence. You know, we would argue that doing something serious, and I know JD would agree, JD Vance, that is, doing something serious about not merely the constitutional, the punishment of corporations for constitutionally protected speech. That's not what this is about. It's, it's basically a collusive deal between a bunch of corporations uh, being goaded on by a certain faction of the US government on the left uh, to spread lies about um, voting laws in certain states, Georgia being the leading case in this, this whole effort, to basically collusively boycott those states so, so as to override the will of the voters of those states. I think there's more at stake there than merely the constitutionally protected speech of those corporations. But how you deal with that, that's a messy business. Uh, JD in a couple of tweets probably didn't capture his whole view of the matter. But to just narrow in on this uh, in this way that French does, again, was another example of him doing his favorite thing, which is to punch right. You know, if the threat of uh, the sort of increasingly woke, of increasingly woke capital uh, begins to really impinge on the ability of voters in a state to set uh, what is their right, their approach to voting in that state, and we deny the premise that these these laws were somehow you know voter suppression or racist in places like Georgia and elsewhere. If corporations are wading into that on the side of of a faction of the oligarchy that uh, currently holds national power, uh, if if by a threat, only a threat in the Senate and then in the presidency and in the House, if that whole apparatus has as its design a, a further slip into despotism, then you know prudence would dictate that you take seriously the play in the joints uh, of both federalism and constitutional action and policy to deal with that problem. And it might be a little more than you would have done four years ago. So that's. That would be my response to part one of Jonah's rant. I mean, it's kind of telling, I think, that this is, and, and I should stipulate that I too have profited from Jonah's work. I should say from Mr. Goldberg, I've never met him from Jonah Goldberg's <laughs> work. Uh, I profited from the National Review, of which he was sort of erstwhile major player, and, and from the Weekly Standard back when it existed. So it's not as if, I feel, you know, a sense of rage or animus, but I do think it is telling that we are discussing all these people as a prelude to an entire series on the state of the right. Time was not too long ago that they would have been a whole segment in the state of the right, a serious faction of conservative of the conservative intellectual movement that needed, you know, attention as like one of the possible options of where we might go from here. The fact that they are now not even included in that survey suggests to me a certain degree of irrelevancy that they're like are, there is now an entire constellation of interesting, dynamic, conservative uh, thinkers, schools of thought who are engaged in the real and urgent and active intellectual business of thinking through how we're going to address some of these issues, like the massive reshuffling of the country, like the unprecedented threat of big tech to free speech, like the rising ascendancy of a very dedicated ruling class with pretty serious ambitions to install one party rule and enforce some really dark things in the country as a whole and around the world. All of these questions, which are extremely new and extremely urgent, are being thought out in real time by Catholic integralists, by constitutionalists, based constitutionalists such as ourselves, by uh, any number of like interesting suits on Twitter, by a whole new party of people who will be shaping, uh, hopefully, the Republican Party as it shifts in the direction that it's been shifting since Trump toward the working class, uh, toward a real cultural seriousness, toward a more pugnacious stance vis-a-vis -vis political correctness and so forth. Um, all of this is happening, like, basically without the input of Jonah Goldberg and the Bulwark and all these other like the dispatch, not because they're bad or wrong or evil. Well, I do think they're wrong, but not because they're evil or devoted to some kind of sabotage, although it sometimes feels that way of other conservatives, but simply because the, they're not having the conversation that the rest of us are all having. Like we're all 
way, way past the sort of William F. Buckley, Ronald Reagan era that they still seem to be living in. And not that those people weren't great men of and statesmen and thinkers of their day, just that, you know, this, like this is so over. I don't know. The reason why the rhetoric gets spicy is because the politics of respectability has discredited it itself. I, you know, nobody set out hoping that one day respectability would be a sign of political impotence and of failed policy in America. But, you know, correlation is not causation, but here we are. So, you know, when, when you call someone a Judas, you are not accusing them of having actually killed Jesus. When you call someone a Quisling, you are not actually accusing them of, uh, of setting up a puppet government in Norway. You know, when you call someone <laughs> Brutus, I mean, it's a long list. And these are these are evocative expressions designed to rough people up with political speech. And why? Because there is a crowd that used to be very influential, very well established, very sure of themselves, very confident, even occasionally a little bit smug. And uh, and, and now they're not on Fox News every night. And now, you know, they're not at the top of of the pile in terms of relevance and influence in Washington. And they, uh, you know, they can get on their podcasts as, as we all do and complain about it. But what is missing is any serious sustained effort at taking responsibility for fizzling out as a movement. Uh, and, and it all becomes criticism of whether it's us or other people in the firmament who, uh, you know, who are, are taking it upon ourselves to try to rethink what happened. And, uh, you know, for, for people like Jonah to all, Kevin Williamson, I mean, it's a long list of guys who, the minute they get any pushback, it's, well, the people on your side are freaking idiots. They're, they're, they're ugly, infirm, diabetic, troglodytes, you know, just the worst deplorable, you know, deplorable doesn't even begin to describe the scum of the earth that, that has tainted, uh, allegedly, this, this side of the movement. And it's just this, this steadfast refusal to take any personal responsibility or, or movement responsibility for the complete face plant that we've seen unfold and that has caused so many people to get spicy in their language. They're frustrated. They're sick of it. They know that we're out of time. There's no more time to sit around and, and traffic in the politics of respectability and use respectability as a way of deflecting responsibility. It's, as Spencer said, it's over. It's long past over and the clock is ticking. And something more assertive, if not occasionally more aggressive, is needed. And it's not going to come from them. The only thing that's going to come from them are cheap shots and insults and defending their principles instead of trying to defend their own actions and taking responsibility for what happened. It's frustrating. I'll just say briefly, I, I wrote my own eulogy, very personal, for Jonah Goldberg three years ago. The first thing I wrote, I think, for the American Mind site called Twilight and the ne Twilight of the Never Trumpers by yours truly Matthew J. Peterson of the American Mind and it was just kind of a eulogy for Jonah who I always liked because there was a time when he was the upstart right and he was getting really punchy with people online but oh is he a serious scholar I don't know and he's just a blogger and he was very good at what he did he saw uh, initially how digital interplay works, um, but I'm just I, I'm just over it like everyone else is. I mean, I, I just feel like these guys. Um, there's all kinds of criticisms you can make justifiably about the quote unquote new right or what's happening, um, but at a certain point, you're either talking about reality or you're not. And and uh, I, you know, I just think all of us are at a point where we don't need to be scolded by people who just have no idea what's going on or or in complete kind of almost psychotic denial. Um, talking about, you know, who's for the Constitution. I mean, you know, if you're for the Constitution, then you wouldn't live in a fantasy world um, pretending that, you know, somehow we're still fighting the same battles of 40 years ago. Um, so I, I don't even I mean, I, I just really don't really want to say anything about it because this is a case of, of watching two completely different movies as the saying goes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, let them sail off into whatever Neverland they're in. The only thing um, that I think is and I think partially why we're addressing it in this podcast, the thing that's troubling is there's still a lot of people who are good people, um, some of whom are still friends of mine. 
um, who listen to these people out of habit and they don't have time to pay attention to politics. So they know a few names over the last 20 years in politics and they still listen to some of these folks. I think most of them are coming around and realize they're irrelevant, but there still are a lot of people who do gravitate towards their, their opinion as if it matters. But I mean, even then, I, why bother? Why bother in a way? Because in the next two years, it'll just be, I think, completely over and shattered and done. Um, so it's it's more for the audience that we're speaking than you know actually caring about what these these guys' opinions are. I guess I consider myself lucky. I sort of came to the right sort of late, um, like maybe just a little before Trump came on the scene. So to me, people like Jonah Goldberg just always seem like flatulent like dopes and it never nothing they said when i was on the other side interesting we should we should just let me just interrupt you real quick seth we should just say because we haven't said this yet i don't think in the podcast seth is quietly like more based than uh you know pretty much everyone here in a way i mean seth was quietly uh you know working at city journal and uh and more based than all of us combined listen to this I, I wouldn't go that far, but, you know, I mean, the fact that Jonah Goldberg went to a girl's school its first year of going co-ed just kind of, like, says everything. <laughs> That's a bit of a low, low blow, but it is amusing. <laughs> okay, let's jump to section two. Um, so, I, in, the, in this section, I jump around a little bit, just pointing pulling out what we want to use for our purposes. We'll just jump in in media rest as it were. Part of my response is that a lot of the time when I'm criticizing so-called conservatives and right-wingers these days, I feel like I'm still criticizing the left. So uh, just one more uh, note to Benna from uh, your your, uh, host here. I chose this one because it's sort of, it's illustrative of, I think, left and right and arguments about left and right and why I think we think it's they're somewhat inadequate. I simply see big chunks of this nationalist populist stuff as Republicans, self-described Republicans, conservatives, whatever you want to call them, moving leftward. What I find so problematic is that so much of this new stuff from populist conservatives is proving me wrong. This is why, and he's, what's proving him wrong is that, um, you know, he sort of goes through his view of the of right and left and the historic tradition of right and left and how it's all, it was always different in America than it was say blood and soil, Europe, et cetera. Uh, it, it proving me wrong. This is why I keep wanting to finish that dumb essay about revisiting liberal fascism. That was Jonah's uh, first breakout book. Uh, when JD Vance talks about how we need to punish corporations that express concerns about voting rights in Georgia, whether the corporations are right or wrong, whether they're just doing it to get on the right side of the right demographic, it doesn't matter. He says, raise their taxes or do whatever else is necessary to fight these goons. These goons being these various mainstays of the globalist oligarchy. That's not concern. And uh, Jonah on the podcast, you know, whenever he does globalist oligarchy, he mimics Trump. He obviously thinks the term is worthless and and stupid. That's not conservative in the Anglo-American tradition. That's nationalist hogwash. You can go across just a vast sweep of what the things that Josh Hawley and these people are talking about, never mind all the stuff that Trump talked about, that it strikes me as simply a rejection of what conservatism used to mean, and they move leftward. If you think that, like control of big corporations, if you think that soaking the rich, if you think of nationalizing various industries for the good of the proletariat, these are all in my book, or at least in the Anglo-American context, pretty left-wing things, not right-wing things. When you see people talking about yoking big business to the political agenda of the right or punishing businesses that aren't loyal to the agenda of the right, that's a move left for me. Um, first of all, uh, as we, I hope, indicated in the first section, or I did anyway in my commentary, that's not what J.D. Vance is really talking about. This, to me, I mean, Jonah's smarter than this. This is a willful misinterpretation of what Vance wants to do. He does not desire us to yoke big business to the political agenda of the right or punish them uh, merely for opposing the agenda of the right. There's something deeper at stake, which which touches on um, you know the principles of republicanism, small r republicanism in America. I think, you know, talking about left or right policies uh, leads more often than not to basically worthless analysis these days. I mean, encrusted on all that, it's it's like saying something's conservative or not, or uh, or big government. That's big government policy. That's that's not conservative. Uh, we encountered this with this trans business and the, the governor of, of Arkansas uh, a couple weeks ago. 
you know, encrusted on all this are sort of stale categories and abstractions from the last 40 years of conservatism uh, in America and then the partisan clashes that grew out of them. Um, uh, yeah. And yeah, nobody really, not even Holly isn't, Vance isn't, nobody, nobody wants to merely yoke a uh, big business to the political points of the right. Uh, it's just, it's just so, it's such a myopic view of what's going on here. And, and as I said, Jonah and French both know better. And uh, it's just a disservice they're doing to public commentary, among other things, to talk this way. So you, you wonder about their, their motives or their agendas uh, rather than just their dispassionate analysis. These guys are smart, but they're just not educated as to how technology is, is creating certain pressures in our, in our social lives and in our economic life. I mean, the corporation has gone to a place that, you know, I was maybe talking about in 2008 and some other people have been talking about over the course of the, the ensuing years. But most people did not expect the corporation to become what it is now, which is basically a kind of church, which is something that is trying to to enchant working as, you know, as what is increasingly like a cubicle drone at what is increasingly a, a business organization that has become detached from uh, from the 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 host country of of the United States of America, and just the way that wokeness has rolled through the corporations, in the same way that it's rolled through academia and rolled through government, you know, this is a response to what technology what technology is doing to us, and and how technology is now calling into question uh, the whole sort of post war, you know, modern to post modern socio economic order. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one response. I mean, it's, 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 it, you can, you can see the logic of, of how it would happen, but, you know, for, for Jonah, it's still 1985 and corporations are just, you know, just, just businesses. And just because they're this size or that doesn't mean that you should treat them any differently. Uh, but there's no, you know, there's no understanding of why this is unfolding and there's no understanding of, of where it's going. And so a, as a consequence, you know, corporations are being treated by these guys as if the past 25, 30 years hasn't happened as if we're not headed into a period of, of deindustrialization, depopulation, and a period where you know uh, the left. You know, if we're going to talk about right versus left, uh, it's it's the left that is posing the greatest risk of of uh, establishing a religion in America right now. Uh, that was something the left used to accuse the right of doing. You know, twenty years ago, this is. I mean, you know, you, you can remember when George W. Bush was president. It was oh, the theocrats on the right are going to establish it. You know, they're they're going to they're going to enforce their religion over all Americans. Those days are over. That's not the world that we live in anymore. And large scale changes that are that are transforming America and life and transforming uh, the the way that we relate to. Uh, to government and to corporations, you know, these things need to be thought through very carefully and they need to be given intellectual respect. Uh, you know, Matt does this, I do this, other, you know, just, Jonah, open the CRB and you will see that, that you know, what's going on in there is, is actually thinking through what's happening right now. And in fact, what's already happened, you know, stuff that, that maybe some of these guys will concede, well, maybe in the future, it'll go down a wrong road. We've been down that wrong road. We've been down it for for over a generation, and some of us are reckoning with that fact, and some of us aren't. Don't you think? I mean, part part of it may be. I, I mean, we're uh, sort of anomalous in that. I mean, these people have they ever started an LLC? Like, have, have they ever, you know, paid the fees and and like created a, a, a business with other people in any way whatsoever? I mean, have they have they done consulting? Have they done like a, you know a, a fairly just a, a little bit of a slice of various jobs in American life? You just get the sense they're completely out of touch with what actual corporations are like, with what's going on in you know, the various kinds of business. I mean, they see business as one thing. First off, like what the hell does business even mean, right? I mean, they have this this weird. 30 year old cartoon that just seems completely removed from any actual human American experience, probably because they were working for, um, you know, the same, the same people and just writing for too long. And I think one of the hilarious things is you can make fun of uh, some of us all you, all you want for being <laughs> in uh, the writing game, the academic game, but there's a, there's a, actually a lot of varied experience here. Um, where if you have to scrap and strive and you've tried a bunch of different things, you know, you get a modicum of experience and you traveled around, you get experience about what the way the world works. It, it, a lot of what they say is just, I mean, there seems to be no 
no understanding or no communication with people who are, you know, with a wide variety or a slice of American life. And that's where, um, you know, that's, be, that's where it becomes sad. I mean, it really is sad to me. I mean, it, it's people who probably had talent to do a variety of things, but for whatever reason, get caught, they get caught in a slipstream and sort of fade away. And eventually their only audience will be, um, you know, maybe a small subset of boomers who are in complete denial, uh, probably willfully, because they don't want to acknowledge the, the painfulness of what's going on or the difficulty of what's going on in real life. And, uh, you know, I just, I mean, part of me doesn't have time for it. Um, the other part of me thinks it's important to talk through because there's a kind of mental pathology here that's important to counter. Um, there's an obstacle in all of us to, um, to reckoning with what's real because what's real is often painful and prevents, presents us with obstacles we don't want to actually have to challenge or confront. And in this case, you know, it's, it's almost like it's pathological, it's diseased where they're at. Um, but with the rest of us too, I mean, you know, we have to be um, constantly making sure we don't fall into this trap of being in some kind of slipstream where we're just talkers and we have a spiel and, uh, you know, we keep on with that spiel and like Darth Vader at the end of the first Star Wars in the 70s, <laughs> we just spin out into space. And, and that's where they're all at, you know. Charles Kessler once told me that Buckley's advice to him, maybe it wasn't directly to him, but general advice was... Uh... Never use a good thing only once. This is you know, in speeches and all that kind of thing. But yeah, if you uh, if you uh, if you do it long enough, it can be a bit uh, a bit much and really spin out of control, as you say, Matt. All right, let me just read this final section and then we can uh, close out. So uh, this is a slightly longer section, uh, but it's worth a good finish. The majority may not have called itself left, and it's, it continues this theme of right and left. But get rid of the labels for two seconds. This is something Chris Steyerwalt and I talk about all the time. The straight line, conservative, Paul Ryan, Phil Graham, Jonah Goldberg, if I may, vision of what politics and government policy should look like is not popular and will unlikely ever be really popular. You might be able to cobble together the majority to defend some of it, but it's just not popular. People like free stuff. People like being given money. People like getting more from the government than they pay in taxes. People also tend not to think seriously about politics. It doesn't mean that they're not smart. It means they're normal people thinking about other stuff. One of the genius things about the founding, again, forget the left right stuff for a second. One of the genius things about the founding is that the founding fathers understood this as rules of human nature. Not progressives are always good and conservatives are always bad or conservatives are always good or progressives are always bad. It was that they understood that when you get large numbers of people together and they're pissed off, they're going to demand things that probably aren't good for protecting the long-term viability of the country that aren't going to be well thought through. That's why they created all of these buffers and filters and systems to let deliberation and compromise work itself out. That's not the whole reason why we have two legislative branches or why we make it hard to amend the constitution, but it's a big part of it. It's just this idea of letting these ideas sluice around a bit until they can get better absorbed into the soil, until people will have time to ruminate on them. If you want to get rid of all these checks and balances that are inherent to the classical liberal understanding of how government works, you're going to get yourself into a hot mess. Those mechanisms, again, they may not be good right now for Republicans. A lot of the issues that the system has constructed or is protecting, like gun rights, like freedom of worship, the more you get rid of the anti-majoritarian elements of the Bill of Rights or of the courts or just our constitutional structure, the more likely those things are going to be in jeopardy. Lastly, I just find that this stuff is, as a matter of punditry, counterproductive. The way Trump governed and the way Trump supporters acted is one of the reasons why you got Biden. It's one of the reasons why the politics right now are so bad for conservatives. The more you embrace that stuff and you actually make structural changes to the constitutional order. So I, you know, this is the, this is part of the fantasy land. I think that Matt's pointing out that they're living in. Um, I mean, the notion that we're kind of in it. They win, we lose. Next time we win, they lose, or somewhere in between, uh, is I think woefully um, inadequate to our present moment. I mean, the notion that our checks and balances and the founders' constitution is robust rather than quite decayed uh, and at constant onslaught. I mean, after COVID for God's sake, uh, let alone the sort of hysterical, insane overreaction to January 6th, and then wrapped up in all that, the kind of aggressive racialist identity politics that, that seeks to kind of sweep up the heights of our 
the commanding heights of our culture and institutional life, and along with it, how we conduct government at the national level. And if um, the Democrats have their way in HR1 at the state level too, I mean, the notion that any of this is robust and will somehow keep, uh, you know, the waters in their paths and thus, uh, you know, and if we, if we just, uh, go along and get along and not say anything too mean or too outre that, uh, you know, we, this, this will, and on top of all that, this will keep our permanent minority position, which Jonah seems to, to uh, argue for here. I guess he's talking about his wonker wonk position, uh, that somehow this is stable or that it will last or that it won't lead to you being a per, really a permanent mi minority in, uh, with uh, with all the problems of a majority faction that the founders pointed out, namely your rights being violated routinely. I just all it's you know he misses this whole this whole forest for these trees he wants to point out. So uh, that's the last I'll say about Jonah. But uh, the floor is open for you guys to close us out. I have a question, really, for anyone who is out there who knows or is someone who takes Jonah Goldberg seriously at this point. I mean, I want to know why, right? What, 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 what in particular about his, his arguments or what he's saying, other than the habit of listening to him or his ilk, is, is still, you know, rattling around in your head? I am curious about that because I, I do see a fair amount of people who are within the conservative, quote unquote, bullseye, who, who still have some kind of passing attraction or, or gravitational pull towards these arguments. And it is holding us back in some way. I mean, I think within two years, as I said, it, it'll be all be gone. But I, I'm curious about what that is. So if you're out there listening and, you know, you're, you're hearing Ryan read through this and you're saying, well, yeah, but, um, you know, he does make some good points. I, I want to know what those are or why, um, why this argument is attractive either to you or people you know. We'll, um, we'll talk about publications in these finals. Uh, so we'll do a final segment in the coming weeks talking about the lay of the land. One will be publications, one will be think tanks. I think one might be just factions. Generally speaking, we'll figure out how to structure it. But um, one bit of overlap is Jonah, Jonah now has a position at AEI that he got uh, not too long ago, a couple years ago. It was one of the soft landings post, uh, or right with concomitant also uh, almost with the dispatch stuff. So with all that, I just want to plug two things on our way out. Uh, before I do my normal uh, outro, and that is, um, we've been getting some great love from one of the good aggregators out there these days, uh, like the Dan Bongino website, um, citizenfreepress.com is trying to replace uh, Drudge, which has gone weird and corrupt and, and uh, you know, sort of center, left of center in many ways, or at least uh, was very anti-Trump, and then now that that baggage has been carried forward. And then also, uh, we have a special edition podcast uh, from the American Mind. It's not a roundtable. It's an interview with uh, Mike Anton, senior fellow at Claremont, and also a research fellow at the at the uh, at Hillsdale College's uh, Washington D.C. Center, where he teaches as well. He interviews for about an hour and forty minutes. Friend of Claremont, Charles Haywood, who runs a a nice website many of you may know called theworthyhouse.com. Uh, Charles was uh, anonymous at his at his uh, book review for a long time. It's it's a fun story which he recounts in in uh, he basically launched that site because Amazon decided to kick him off because he was such a prolific and highly ranked reviewer and was too right wing. So that's fun in and of itself. But Charles uh, Charles uh, a man who actually does stuff for a living, makes stuff uh, or did sold his manufacturing business uh, not too long ago in the Midwest, and so now can actually use his full name and not cause his uh, family and, and company grief. So uh, Charles is a great guy. Charles has reviewed Anton's book, among other things, but the, the conversation is sort of wide ranging. They talk about America, they talk about Straussianism, they talk about the state of our regime, what's to come, what could come, reasons for hope, reasons for despair. It's, uh, it's a good listen, especially for you junkies out there. So thank you all for listening to The Roundtable. If you want to support our work, visit claremont.org slash donate. And if you want to learn more about all our projects and writing, visit our websites at americanmind.org, claremont.org, claremontreviewbooks.com, and our new Washington Center for the American Way of Life at dc.claremont.org. Please rate, share, and subscribe at Apple Podcasts. Rate us well, please. It helps our ranking or wherever you get your podcast. And thanks, as always, to Jake Gannon and Annalisa Lee, our production and engineering crew. And thank you all for listening for this slightly longer episode than normal. Uh, we had fun. Hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you all next week. Mm -hmm.